Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first live-streamed cryptocurrency interview. Most of these I've been doing, I have only just recorded them. But my guest today is Georgie Stolfi, uh, a professor, actually, who has been talking about cryptocurrency a lot. And I was really excited that he agreed to do an interview with us because I've really been enjoying the stuff he has to say, and I would love to be able to ask some questions and hear his thoughts. Uh, welcome to the program. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I uh, I was wondering if you might be able to uh, give the viewers some idea of why you're interested in this topic and sort of how you got into it. Because I, uh, from you know your your past work, you did a lot of work on stuff like computational geometry and stuff. In fact, the, the sorts of things that we love on this stream normally actually. Uh, cryptocurrency wasn't wasn't your thing, but you got interested in it. Can you give a, a little bit of a, a background on, on how that started and, and what you've been doing? Yeah, well, my, my uh, cryptocurrency for me is a hobby more than, I mean, my real work is still in co computer graphics, image processing, uh, numerical methods for those things, some graph theory and things like that so <clears throat> i'm i'm not an expert really on cryptography or networking but i think i know enough <laughs> to 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 not believe to be very skeptical about uh, cryptocurrencies in general right and blockchain technology and everything like attached to them <clears throat> so and so you i started follow yeah i started following the the, the cryptocurrency scene in 2004 13, very in December 2015, when, when uh, the price crashed after Mount China blocked things and Mount Gox collapsed and things like that. I mean, uh, people asked me, I mean, whether Bitcoin was something like the Telex Free, which was a big MLM scheme ah. that was running here in Brazil. <clears throat> and I said, well, what is this thing? <laughs> Let me see what it is. <laughs> okay, and uh, I mean, uh, so I follow it mostly for the for the uh, comedy, right? But oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is unbelievable. This before that, I had other. I mean, I followed the, the Voynich manuscript for five, several years. I mean, it was was uh, that was my hobby, and then okay. before that, I followed. The, Cold Fusion. I don't know if you have ever heard of it. I have not. It was, no, it, it was a, two chemists uh, thought that they had discovered a way to get uh, nuclear fusion in a jar. Oh, the, tr the, the heavy water, the, the tritium one that was... Yeah, okay, the, the yes, heavy I water do that. electrolysis. Yeah, so yes. I followed that for several years too. I mean, but, <laughs> so it is, the, the, this is the, the, the cold fusion. <laughs> of the, of, of now. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't know, I've been following ever since then and reading lots of posts by everybody, papers and white papers and things like that. So uh, if I have your sort of uh, take on cryptocurrency correct, because uh, this is the first time we've, we've ever spoken, so I only know sort of what I've read, you're, you're very skeptical of it in general. Uh, it, it sounds like you're not particularly convinced of most of the claims that people are making. Is that a fair, just to, just to sort of set the table for where you're coming from, uh, what your perspective was on it? Uh, well, I mean, you can look at it, at, uh, well, uh, if you look at it from the point of view of investment, I mean, I think it's just a big Ponzi scheme. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, because there is no money that uh, comes in and get, goes to the investors. Uh, uh, the only way that people can get money from investing in Bitcoin is by taking money from other investors. So that, that's the definition of Ponzi scheme, basically, <laughs> that your, own, your profit only comes from money that other investors put in. There is no revenue stream. Like a, comp no, a company normally has client products and clients and the money that the clients give to the company, that's the revenue of the investors. But uh, there are no such things in in Bitcoin and will never be, there will never be. So, yeah. So, so from your perspective, so you're kind so of much. thinking of it as <laughs> like a, uh, you're, you're thinking of it just as a closed system and you're saying, look, where does the money come from and where does the money go? Yeah, we can exactly. see that fairly clearly. Is that? Mm -hmm. 
exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe it is because, I mean, people who go to college, they learn about conservation theories, in, in uh, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation. So, I mean, it's very instinctive now, almost, to, to when you see an investment scheme like that. I mean, well, where, where does the money come in and go out? I mean, uh, there is no money going in. But anyway, but you are not interested in the investment part. There is another aspect that is the legality of it. And uh, it is the perfect tool for, for money laundering and uh, uh, ransomware. That, that's something that actually uh, I mean, concerns us. Uh, is um, was unknown before. I never heard of ransomware before I started following Bitcoin. And, Me neither, uh, yeah. Maybe you heard it. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. And now, now, now it is, seems to be the, uh, it, apparently it has already caused $5 billion of damage. And um, it is the major form of computer crime. I just read that uh, the Sinclair TV network, 200 and some stations, oh. went off the air because <laughs> of the ransomware okay. attack. <laughs> yeah, just now. Right? Wow. Okay. <laughs> So I mean, there is the, so that other angle too. It's very bad, but I think that it doesn't concern us again, right? So we are talking about only the technology. Uh, well, uh, actually, and... uh, if I could, I actually already had a question about what you said on the investment side because I am kind of interested in what you said there. Uh, so when you talked about the fact that it was a kind of a, a system where the money that comes in and the money that goes out it just that's all there is so people have to put money in for anyone to have gotten money out mm -hmm. i guess i'm interested what's the difference though if we think about this as a currency what would be the difference between this and say something like just us dollars um or you know Chinese yuan or something like that, because currency in general is just a medium of exchange. So wouldn't that be based to the same thing for something like Bitcoin? The idea is to try and get it to a point where people are just using it as a means of circulation, right? Because in a normal currency, you know, there's no payouts to investors, right? Yeah, and well, that's one problem, right? If, if, it, uh, if it were a really a currency, there would be no point in investing in it. Uh, because, uh, I mean, a, a good currency has to be stable. In fact, a good currency has to be slightly inflationary because right. if it is, if the value of the currency increases with time, people will start hoarding it and then it will increase even more and then it will be unstable, then people will suddenly dump it and then it will drop. So, so the, I mean, economists are agree with the, that currencies must have a, a few percent of inflation per year uh, in order to be stable. And uh, the, the national currencies, they are stable because the central banks monitor inflation uh, in cons I mean, by looking at thousands, tens of thousands of products uh, all across the country and uh, um, taking averages and so forth and then correcting by increasing or taking or reducing the supply in circulation in order to keep the value stable. So Bitcoin doesn't have any of that. So that's why well, its price goes up and down. So you might say that the, the two things are sort of counterposed. Like either Bitcoin is a good currency and therefore you wouldn't want to invest in it. You'd just use it when you needed mm -hmm. it. Or Bitcoin isn't a good currency, <clears throat> in which case it's a Ponzi scheme investment, but it can only be <laughs> one or the other. Would that be a fair, a fair uh, sort of summary? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. People invest in it because they expect the value to go up and go up I mean, absurdly, right? I mean, and um, if its value goes up absurdly, it is not going to be a currency, just, just from that point. But apart from that, I mean, even from the technical point of view, um, I mean, uh, the, the, in my view, I mean, my view of what Satoshi was doing, I mean, I think that he was a computer professional that probably, I mean, I imagine him as being a, a, develop, a, a software developer at a big bank with a boring job, <laughs> nine to five. Yes. <laughs> but then um, in, the, in his spare time, uh, I had this, this idea that he 
he heard about the problem of um, building a decentralized payment system, a payment system without a central authority somewhere. And uh, he knew that, uh, obviously knew that uh, computer scientists had given up on that problem in the, 19, the early 90s, uh, when they I mean, realized that um, um, the, basically the Byzant Byzantine generous problems uh, is unsolvable unless you have uh, uh, I mean, at least uh, half of the <coughs> nodes are honest, or um, sometimes even two thirds have to be honest in order to, to, for the thing to, to happen. And if, uh, and if you have a decentralized payment system without a central authority, <coughs> There is no way you can guarantee 50% honest people, right? Um, at least not if they are volunteer. I mean, that anyone can come in because the attacker can generate uh, tens of thousands of fake nodes and overwhelm the honest ones at time. And if it is a payment system, there is enough motivation for people to do that, right? I mean, networks like Networks like, uh, I mean, BitTorrent or, or Emeo or the old Usenet News, I mean, they, they were decentralized, uh, but uh, there, there was no incentive to attack them because uh, I mean, the worst thing that, you, that could happen is that you cannot download your, your, pirate, pirate, <laughs> your pirate, um, pirate movie. <laughs> From from some certain note, I mean, and well, okay, <laughs> uh, uh, but money a money system, of course, is very different. It has to be secure, and uh, people could not make it secure, so they gave up in the nineteen uh, nineteen ninety three, I think, or something like that, was the last time they they talked about the problem. So this might be, this point. might be actually a perfect place for me to just ask. Uh, since you are a professor, could you perhaps give the folks listening to these interviews just a quick pointer about where they would read more about something like the Byzantine generals problem? Because a lot of people actually don't know about the two generals problem or the Bi Byzantine generals problem. And these are kind of fundamental theories you would want to know about if you're trying to understand cryptocurrency. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I... I... I am not uh, an expert in that area, so I don't have any good uh, uh, paper that would say would be readable for, for lots of programmers and software developers or whatever. There is one reference that I know that is called, uh, it is by Cynthia Dwork. Uh, I, can, uh, I can put the uh, link in the description when I post this video, in fact. Okay. If you just name, um, the, name the paper or send me the link afterwards, you can just describe it now. Yeah. yeah, I think it is this, uh, let me see, I just, well, uh, yeah. I will post it later, yeah, yeah. okay, but, um, um, but um, it is said, I mean, a longish paper that analyzes the problem of getting consensus among several uh, nodes where some nodes may be uh, faulty or malicious. Uh, and um, so the <coughs> malicious nodes may, try, may lie to other <clears throat> to their neighbors, uh, trying to prevent them from getting a consensus on some, say, whether a bit should be zero or one, <laughs> something like that. Okay. Uh, and so they concluded there that uh, you need at least two thirds of the nodes uh, uh, to be honest in order to, to, for the honest nodes to get to an agreement. Otherwise, the malicious nodes can always disrupt the thing prevent either pre by preventing them to reach from reaching an agreement or by having half of them of the honest nodes think that the bit is zero and the other half think that the bit that they agreed upon is one. Um, so, uh, and the distributed payment system needs uh, something of that sort because, um, um, I mean, if you pay, well, basically, there, 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 it has to do at least three things. You must uh, make sure that uh, uh, when uh, when uh, someone pays another person, the, the person is sending the payment is the owner of the account from which the payment is going to be taken out. And that's solved by cryptographic signatures, right? Yes. That's why the computer scientists were all excited about this problem, 
because they well they had invented those um, public key uh, crypt, uh, systems that let them do lots lots of things that they couldn't do before, and they thought well maybe it will let us do this thing too. Okay, so well, so you can verify. Uh, that the person sending the check is actually the owner of the account. You can verify that the, you have to verify that the account has funds mm. and that you can do by having a, the ledger of all transactions be public so that anyone can go there and check all the chain of payments and trace the funds back to the mint uh, when the money was created and see that the money is in there in the account. And the third thing is that you, make me sh make, you must make sure that when the person pays a check out of that account, it doesn't is not paying to several pe people right. from the same <laughs> the same amount right, of money. Right. That's the double the double spending yes. problem, right? And well, no one could figure out a yeah. way of solving that because uh, for that you needed everybody to agree on one copy of this distributed ledger. Uh, and that was the problem. I mean, you, the, 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 there was no way of ensuring that uh, there was agreement. A malicious attacker could get half of the network to think that the ledger was A, half to think that the ledger was B, and in A, you paid one guy, and B, you paid another guy from the same account. Uh, um, so that's why the computer science gave up on the idea. Uh, around 1993, and but uh, I mean the cypherpunk still kept churning uh, the same problem because um, their their dream is to make a society of um, uh, um, um, cyf of, <laughs> of cybernauts on, on the internet that uh, can function uh, independent out of the reach of governments. Uh, and without any sort of authority or something that control controls the society. So for that, they needed a, a payment system in order to have a society that can be called that thing. And, uh, and that payment system had to be distributed. So they kept working on that for something like 15 years or so. Uh, I mean, so there were several proposals uh, that well the people describe the system but then they got to that point where how do you prevent the double spending and they said well we are still work to do <laughs> here right we have to uh, so maybe we need find a way um, and so satoshi apparently thought that he had an idea to solve that uh, but he was not aware apparently of many of those of uh, most of the, the, those attempts by cypherpunks. Uh, he wasn't even aware of the work of Cynthia Dwork and there were others on that that problem. Can you, but, can you uh, mention those uh, specifically? Just uh, I can also put them in the link below, but sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Oh, uh, which work? That is Wei Dai okay. is one of them, and uh, Nick Zabo, Shabo okay. is another one. Uh, can, you know the name? Uh, you know the names? No, you can. Do you need me to spell them? I uh, no, that's okay. I'll I'll write them down and I'll get them from you after. Just I just want to make sure I have my notes here. I can so type that... them in chat. No, no, it's fine. I've got it. Okay. Yeah. But, uh... yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry uh, to interrupt anyway. there, but continuing. So they they didn't know necessarily about the, or, or Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that <laughs> whoever that actually is, didn't perhaps know about this work. Uh, yeah, he, he, I am. Um, he... From the from the way from the people that he quoted in his white he cited in the white paper, and the correspondence that he had with Adam Beck uh, before uh, he released the thing. I mean, it's clear that he didn't. He, he wasn't very much into either the cypherpunk uh, culture or uh, the distributed uh, payment system work that came before by the academics <clears throat> but uh, apparently he wanted he thought that he had found a solution to the problem and wanted the academics to recognize it because he wrote a paper that is a <clears throat> very good paper from academic standards right uh, not not stellar but uh, but um, i wish my students my, my master's <laughs> students, and PhD students could write that well right yes <laughs> so uh, that's a skill that people don't get normally because um, 
I mean, it's not a net, you, you need it to, to write papers and have them rejected by your advisor or, 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 and uh, referees and so forth yep. to learn to write a decent paper. Yep. So, yeah, so, so I think that he had a master's degree, by my guess. Okay. Uh, not a PhD because I think this paper is not quite the level of PhD. Okay. It has something. Okay. 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 <laughs> has a, for instance, it has a piece of C code in the paper. Yeah. That's something that well, it's not not yeah. not uh, not not good form. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So that, that, that's my idea of who Satoshi was. Yes. Right? I mean, so a guy with a master's degree, a competent software developer, but not very much into the thing. That he had this bright idea. He thought, well, maybe if I, with proof of work, uh, we can get around that problem of uh, uh, malicious uh, agents trying to overwhelm the network with fake nodes. Because if I require uh, the, the nodes to do a work, uh, then there is no way that a single attacker can uh, overwhelm I mean, 10,000 other nodes that are working on the same thing. So, um, and so he was very excited. Uh, apparently, he was convinced that he had solved the problem and he posted the paper on a cryptography mailing list, which is read by academics as well as uh, professionals and cyberpunk. I imagine that he was very disappointed when computer science didn't pay any attention <laughs> to this paper. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, because, well, I, I mean, uh, it still didn't uh, quite solve the problem because, of course, it is, as Satoshi himself was aware, I mean, it's still vulnerable to 50%. If you have a ma majority of nodes that are dishonest, they can wreck his system too. Uh, his only argument was that if the um, miners, the, the, the nodes that are uh, calling them, if the nodes are um, um, anonymous uh, and the hashing power is well distributed, I mean, say, so no one single node has more than, say, 1% or 0.1% of the hashing power, then it makes no sense for one node to try to attack the network because it will just waste, um, it will cost a lot, uh, him a lot of money and will be wasted work because the others, uh, even if you collude with, say, I mean, a few hundred uh, miners were to collude, they could, uh, uh, they could not do anything. But uh, the problem is that, well, it was not, um, um, he did not see the, the, uh, the, the, possibility of uh, mining pools. Uh, and in fact, the fact that uh, it was inevitable that um, hashing power would become centralized. Uh, and so now you have about, uh, I think, six, uh, the six largest uh, mining pools, they control uh, something like 70% of the total hashing power. Um, so, well, if even four or five of them were to agree, they could uh, uh, rewind the blockchain and write uh, again. And that happened, in fact, twice. I mean, in 2010, there was a, an overflow bug in the, in the code that someone ex discovered and exploited to create, I think, 4, 4 billion bitcoins <laughs> in one transaction. A very, <laughs> well, suspicious, but... a very suspicious number. <laughs> yeah, by, by, by sending, by sending, well, it was, uh, well, yeah. It is... Two to the 32, right? It's like, well, that sounds like something well, that an overflow might create. Yeah, it yeah. Was, it, well, it yeah. usually uses 64-bit and some oh, okay, 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 okay. But, yeah, but yeah. there are fractions. Okay. The fractions, the, the, the unit is actually 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. Okay. So it is uh, 2 to the 64 of those units. And uh, that, that's about uh, 2 to the 32 or so, so to, <laughs> on that order, man. But then the guy, uh, man, the, the Bitcoin had <clears throat> the facility to compute the, the, the amount of the check by, by a little formula that you could put into the check. I mean, but it, is useless. it was useless because, I mean, well, you could do the math before writing yeah, the yeah. check. But uh, so the guy wrote, uh, 
uh, formula that subtracted a bigger number from a smaller number, then you got a negative overflow. And since it was unsigned it digits, then the output was. Yep. And it was every, everybody accepted that right? <laughs> <laughs> because everybody was using the same, same math to validate the code. And so, well, so they discovered it in, I mean, in about, I think it was probably half a day after that. Uh, the the CEO of Bitcoin, right? The, the guy who was uh, uh, in charge of the maintaining the software, he contacted some of the largest miners that were and convinced them to abandon that blockchain, go back and rebuild one starting 50, 50 blocks earlier and build a new one, excluding that transaction and uh, also changing the software so that uh, arithmetic operations were no longer allowed. So, so, okay, so that's one a case in which the blockchain uh, was <laughs> actually rewound. Uh, so there were two versions of the blockchain. Can I and, ask? A, uh, can I ask a clarifying question there too? Um, so, uh, it's sort of like one of the things that I've noticed people uh, are often say in this circumstance is they'll say something like. Well, the design of Bitcoin is game theory balanced so that people won't want to do that because if they are miners, they want the currency to be stable or they want the currency to be uh, trusted. So they're not going to do things like uh, try to do fraudulent activities because if fraudulent activities occurred a lot, then the currency people would abandon it. So. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they're sort of suggesting there's a social yeah, no. incentive there. Do you have any thoughts on that? I realize it's not necessarily a technological question, but I'm just curious since obviously you've thought about this a lot, if you have any opinions about that. Well, I mean, it it, um, it works. Uh, it has worked so far in the sense that well, the miners never had a, <clears throat> a strong enough incentive to, to, to do that. I mean, because, uh, well, is <clears throat> Um, the way the miner, I mean, if you imagine, say, 51% of the miners wanted to get money uh, uh, by doing dirty tricks, I mean, so what would they need? Well, they need something like uh, uh, make a big payment to someone, uh, collect whatever gold or whatever it is that they made with that payment, and then rewind the blockchain. Uh, so that they are no longer yeah. paying that guy, they are paying, they, so they get back the bitcoins. Um, it is not easy to, to to find a situation where that happens, right? So, yeah, and it is risky because well, there may be legal consequences, or <laughs> the guy may. <clears throat> so, um, uh, but there might there might be, uh, I mean. There have been two cases where the the, the blockchain was rewound by good, I mean, good reasons right. yes. uh, at that time, and uh, the second time was another bug that forced them to to, to go back and uh, abandon the majority branch and go to the minority one. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, one of someone. Um, uh, I mean, took advantage of that rewind to to do a double spending. I mean, right? he had to pay, he had deposited ten thousand dollars to pay the processor in Bitcoin, and then he he uh, replaced the transactions by another one. So the payment processor suddenly uh, saw his bitcoins evaporate, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, but in that case, I mean, the, the guy was eventually identified or he identified himself and he paid the money to the to the payment processor. But the transaction was never fixed, right? I mean, so so the, that's double spend. And of course, there is no trace of that. It is not really a double spend in, in, uh, in the sense that yeah. in the blockchain, there are two transactions right. pointing the way. It is, it is a fraudulent reversal, right? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so there is no trace of that in the blockchain now because uh, the blockchain now is just a new branch. The old branch has been abandoned. So if you yeah. uh, think about this too, like one of my major concerns about this sort of thing has been that 
you know, you, you already mentioned that we, you know, in Bitcoin, for example, we're already in a position that seems very similar to the existing banking system, namely that five, six, seven large actors pretty much control what happens in the Bitcoin blockchain, as far as I can tell anyway. What would you say, I mean, would it be a fair statement to say that the goal of this decentralized payment system, namely that large actors can't disenfranchise people from the payment system, can't remove them from it, seems like that would not really be true anymore in a sense because they, since they control the entire blockchain, uh, these actors would have the ability to es essentially blacklist people, to, to keep them off uh, of the blockchain or... Mm -hmm. Is it that because when you create Bitcoin transactions, you're typically using anonymized wallets, it's actually not really a risk because those actors won't know who you are? Um, well, I mean, I think that that's ideal that uh, maybe, um, I don't even know whether Satoshi was really keen on that idea. I think that he was excited about solving the problem that okay. the computer science did. Okay. so but, but, yes. uh, the, yeah, the, yeah. yeah but the, the cypherpunks that took over the, the project afterwards they they certainly uh, wanted that right that that, that was the, what they saw in bitcoin yes um and i think that that idea is is I mean, as broke as uh, collapsed in, for many ways i mean like please yeah. first first most of people keep their bitcoins in exchanges right which are well totally like banks except that there is no insurance there is no no regulation of no <laughs> yeah. accounting and uh, the guy can just close the exchange take away all the coins and say yeah. goodbye which has happened or, <laughs> yeah <laughs> There is one case where the guy left a nice word on the website, right? Yes. <laughs> you may have heard of that case, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's one one way that the, the thing broke down. I mean, that most Bitcoin transactions are done in centralized exchanges or in centralized uh, custodial wallets, right? Uh, um, like uh, yeah, El Salvador is. Uh, yes. the, the Chivo, as far as I know, is a centralized uh, custodial wallet. Yes. So what people have there is not Bitcoins, it is IOUs of Bitcoin. Uh, but um, um, that's one way. The second way is that the, the miners have centralized, uh, actually mining pools, right? I mean, uh, the miners themselves may be more distributed, but... Um, the way the things work is that it is the mining pool that builds the blocks uh, and validates things and decides, even decides which currency, whether it should mine BTC or BCH uh, the, <clears throat> or some other currency with the same uh, hashtag. And then it farms out the jobs, the actual hashing jobs to the miners. But the miners don't even know what is in the block, not, may not even know which currency they are mining. <laughs> I see, I see, I see, yeah. Uh, uh, so, so it is the pools that, that if, that if they wanted to go back and rebuild the blockchain, the miners would not even notice that probably. Wow, that, okay. The actual man. All right. Uh, okay, they, they should just get blocks to mine and they would mine them and, some, and get, back, get paid by the work they do from, <clears throat> by the pool. Uh, as long as the pool pays them, they, they uh, will be satisfied. So, and the third is that, well, the uh, the government has tools, uh, uh, in, in the, it has private companies that do service, that serve the government, like Chinalysis, I think is the most most uh, famous of them, okay. that actually scan the, the blockchain and do all sorts of analysis of transactions <clears throat> to detect try to detect um, I mean, who paid who, uh, I mean, to identify the users. Because I mean, some addresses are known uh, like exchanges. When you, if you post something to the exchange, then the exchange is formally, uh, generally required to keep your identity, right? right. And then uh, they know the uh, dark markets, they have addresses that that where you have to send your payment and the, the cops know that <laughs> those addresses so forth so they can trace lots of things about that and uh, 
most of the traffic in the blockchain, by the way, I think it is probably 90%, I would guess, is mixing, yeah, which is uh, ah. uh, people moving coins from one address to another hundreds, thousands of times in the hope of uh, confusing those, the, that software, the, the, that, that tracing software. But uh, the government has been doing that job. I mean, they have, they have been able to, to uh, bring criminal charges against the drug traffickers uh, based on, on uh, tra that tra blockchain traffic, uh, whatever. Um, there is a case, for instance, the Continental Pipeline ransomware attack that... Right. Uh, okay. Uh, when the government, I mean, the hackers apparently were not very smart and they deposited the, the ransomware in some exchange. That's what they did use it. It's not, I don't think they ever, ex, uh, the, 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 the FBI never explained exactly how they did it. I but see. they recovered a part, good part of that money, apparently because the, um, uh, the, the ransomware hackers were not very smart uh, about their security. Uh, whatever. So, uh, so the pattern okay. kind of looks something like, if in the future somehow we got to the point where everyone was running their own like Bitcoin wallet, so they had it, so they were off, you know, uh, of any kind of aggregation, and they had their own Bitcoin wallet, they we're always using newly generated addresses for payments. So they're somewhat uh, anonymized there. And mm -hmm. uh, we then go, does this actually give us sort of any kind of decentralization or anonymous payment system? And it sounds like the answer from your perspective would be no, because A, the government is already well-versed in analyzing metadata and finding out who you are from patterns. And of course the blockchain makes it impossible to hide that because the entire blockchain mm -hmm. is always kept as a ledger that people can see because it's its only real safety mechanism. And two, that wherever you are actually going to go to do something with the money, meaning however you were planning to get it out into actual usable currency or however you were going to actually go spend it in practice, the government must have control over that entity anyway because they are a grocery store or a actual bank or something that the government can directly touch. So in effect, you're just back to the exact same system we have now. Um, yes, well, th that, I mean, uh, uh, the thing is, I mean, is is uh, is half, I mean, is halfway through, I mean, in a halfway point when it has the, both the bad thing, the bad, the bad consequences of one extreme and the bad consequences of others. Okay, okay. So the the, the, the government tracing is not perfect, right? Yes. It can catch only a fraction of. Mm -hmm all the bad things that people do on the blockchain. Okay. Uh, so, but it, it has enough, it can catch enough of them that you cannot trust that the blockchain is safe, right? right? Yes. So, <laughs> yes, yes. On, the other, on the other hand, it does, since it doesn't catch everybody, <laughs> that there is lots of bad things that's being <laughs> okay. done on the blockchain, like going somewhere or whatever. Yes. Right? So, so we have the, the worst of both, both worlds, I mean, the worst of, of fully controlled payment system and the, <laughs> and the worst of a totally anonymous payment system. That's not going to be a very good selling point. Bitcoin, the worst of both worlds, so invest in Yeah, I yeah. mean, and, and, uh, I mean like, governments, I think, well, that now goes into the politics the, 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 and the policies of uh, the government with regard to cryptocurrencies, right? And uh, 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 they should ban uh, cryptocurrencies just because of that problem. Like, I mean, ransomware, there is no excuse, I mean, for, for them to tolerating something that <laughs> whose main use uh, is yeah. ransomware uh, uh, and other illegal payments, whatever. So, but uh, in the, the government has already banned other things like that in the past. There, there used to be the, the Swiss ba Swiss numbered bank accounts. I don't know if you've right. heard of that. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah they're, they're kind of anonymous and yeah, yeah anonymous. Yeah. You just had a password or something, yeah. and uh, so those were banned. I mean, right? The, the Switzerland, as far as I know, doesn't have, doesn't allow them anymore. Uh, there were barrier bonds that, that uh, pieces of paper that tell you that well, this thing is worth ten thousand dollars, 
by the treasury or this uh, 10,000 shares of General Motors or whatever. And those were used as very large denomination banknotes. Yes. So you could transfer a million dollars in an envelope instead of a big valise. Um, so uh, there was a benefit too. Uh, okay. so, so I think that, and the, the, there was labor to reserve that was also providing a banking service, uh, anonymous banking service. Uh, all that you needed to, in order to open an account was an email. Uh, address and uh, well, the, the U.S. government closed it down after a long battle, uh, and uh, the the creator of Liberty Reserve is now serving, I don't know, thirty years in the U.S. prison. Yes, I, yes, <laughs> I, I do believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Artur Budov, uh, Artur Budovsky is uh, uh, Budovsky is his name. Um, so. Um, and uh, like the stable currencies, like Tether, uh, that are the currencies that are claimed to be pegged one to one to the dollar. So they are not useful as investment, but they are useful as uh, currencies between. Uh, so people, most of the volume of transactions in uh, cryptocurrencies in the cryptocurrency exchanges uh, is done with using those. Uh, stable coins rather than actual money because um, all over the world the banks are closing the accounts of cryptocurrency exchanges so uh, but um, those stable coins they work exactly like liberty reserve i mean you yes. you you, want, uh, you can send money with anonymous accounts <laughs> uh, they are denominated in dollars so it's stable and everything it's a perfect thing uh, and it's centralized because, well, the, 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 um, uh, the, if they wanted the Tether and other companies that run those things, they could control what, uh, which uh, addresses are active or not. So they could require uh, identification for everyone who opens an account there. But they, of course, they don't, they won't they never do that. Uh, and of course, the government uh, would have the ability at any time to force a exchange like Tether because they're working directly with US dollars, the government could come in at any time and require them to do anything they wanted. They could require them to know exactly who all the people are. They could require them to be capitalized a certain way, et cetera, right? Because that's, that's an even more obvious place the government can apply immediate mm -hmm. pressure, I would assume. Well, I don't know if you have been following the Tether. Only saga. a little bit. Only a little bit. Yeah. The, yeah. Okay. Well, they New are York City. I think the Attorney General like yeah. uh, has already filed an action with them against them. Twice. Yeah. Twice yeah, already. Okay. They went against them for for things. But uh, and, and uh, they 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 are banned in New York City or something like that. And uh, uh, since they are based, I think. I think the company is formally based now in the in the Virgin Islands or the Cayman. They so move around. Yeah, they have they have lots yeah. of different. Yeah, they, were yeah. in, they, they were in yeah. Hong Kong. They were yeah. in yeah. Uh, Taiwan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but um, uh, they they the uh, so they are more or less outside of the the reach of the U.S. government as long as they don't serve U.S. residents or U.S. Uh, citizens, the U.S. government cannot do anything about that. It's up to the governments of Hong Kong or yes, Cayman yeah. Islands yes, or whatever yeah. they are. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, but they might be used, uh, but um, the, if the government cannot stop um, uh, U.S. criminals from using the system yeah. <laughs> in practice, right? So it is likely that they will be banned too, but then not by the, the New York Attorney General, right. not by the SEC or whatever. They would, that would have to be by the FBI. And, uh, right, uh, right, right. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, uh, and they, but the problem is that well, they are very big. I mean, uh, Liberty Reserve, I think, has uh, five or six billion dollars of uh, maximum total accounts that at, 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 uh, just before it was shut down. Uh, they are uh, the tether alone is already sixty-five million dollars. Yes, uh, of, of fake dollars. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Play dollars, whatever. Right? <laughs> no one knows exactly 
how much money they, they actually have. But even if they had, they are not, if you read their terms of service, they are not obliged to exchange back USDTs uh, for real USDs. Yes. So the uh, only money that they have in the company, it's as good as if it was belonging to the owners because yes. they are not required to give it back. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. I think that it's inevitable that they will be shut down uh, the same way that Liberty Reserve was. I mean, and, uh, but uh, uh, but that would have to go, for instance, Liberty Reserve, the one problem is that they, since it was based in, I think, Costa Rica, uh, they had to get uh, the government of Costa Rica to agree to extradite the guy. Yes. And then they had also to to agree, collaborate with all other uh, police departments in other countries to bring, build the case against them or whatever. So it takes years for that to happen, unfortunately. Right? But anyway, that's, uh, so that's, but that's uh, politics more than, yes. <laughs> than policy, more than, more than technicals, right? Uh, so let me, uh, just to, to turn to the technical side of things then, um... I, I guess I have two sort of questions, and we can take them in, in either order. The first one is to get back to sort of the distributed consensus problem, which is, I guess, what we could call this in general, because there really isn't much, like you said, the Byzantine generals problem. There isn't really much that you need for a distributed banking system other than distributed consensus. So that's really the primary thing that we're talking about. The crypto cryptographic signatures are nice because they remove some things from that consensus problem that you don't have to worry about anymore. But in general, you still end up with a distributed consensus problem at the end of the day. So one question I have is, is this a good distributed consensus protocol if we were going to use one? Um, and maybe we'll just start with that question, meaning let's suppose for some reason we decided that we're going to give it a shot. We know that we have the 51% problem that we can never really solve because we've proved it's unsolvable, but we're going to do it anyway for some reason. Is Bitcoin's model a good model for distributed consensus given that, or is it just a waste of time? Well, you have to distinguish distributed from decentralized, right? I mean, oh, sorry, yes, I meant, I meant decentralized. Yes, sorry. I, yeah, I, sorry. okay. It's, it's, this, this, uh, like, that's much a confusion. Yes, yes, yes. But that's a confusion that that um, more people often make. I, I mean, distribute. Yes. Yeah, no, no, but I mean, distribute. Uh, it's important to get that clear because uh, uh, many people in, in talk about blockchain technology. They they they, they don't seem to be. <laughs> clear about yes. the distinction yes. it, right so so i mean distributed is easy because you just have uh, several nodes that work on the problem but there is must be a central not uh, there must be a central authority that monitors those guys and takes down the guys who are bad and this, uh, when there is a dispute uh, i mean when they disagree the central authority decides who is right and who is wrong yes so okay uh, I mean, for instance, well, the blockchain technology, right? The blockchain is a terrible database for a ledger. I mean, it, Please elaborate. Yeah, like, like I, that's that's what people would like. Yeah, to I mean, it, it is a sequential list of all transactions. So it is not, uh, I mean, uh, when people talk about database, of course, they, they start with a, a structure that is more than a linear list, yeah. right? They have yeah. trees and B trees and uh, sort of things. <clears throat> But uh, Satoshi couldn't use any of those fancy structures for the for his ledger because uh, when complicated structure when you wanted to update them, you need usually to to lock things because you needed to change things in various places. I mean, if you have, three, if you have a tree, you needed to go up the tree and change the pointers, uh, whatever. And so, <clears throat> well, how do you do that? In a, in a distributed, decentralized uh, way. Well, uh, when uh, one guy may be trying to update pointers one A and B, the other guy might be able to be trying to update the, them too. But one updates <laughs> A, the other one updates B, and then they become inconsistent and so forth. Well, the way you solve that usually is you have a locking system where the guy says, well, I'm going to 
change pointers A and B, please lock them. I will change them. And then now you are ready. Everybody else can, can do. But uh, lock, to lock, to implement a locking, you need a central server. Because there must be a central place that decides, no, that guy now is, has the lock. No, now he releases the lock. Now that guy has the lock. And so, well, you cannot have a locking, uh, at least as far as I know, you cannot have decentralized locking. <clears throat> and so Satoshi couldn't use any of those fancy data structures, trees or B trees or whatever. Um, and the, the only structure that you could use that could be updated uh, in a decentralized way was a linear list because then you don't need to change anything in the data structure. You just need to append another record with a pointer to the previous one, right? And then, well, you can, the, the inconsistency that you can have is that two people can append the two records, but then he has this uh, I mean, the majority of work principle that says that the, if you have two branches, the branch which has most work in it is the real one and you should look at that and forget the other one. So that's, that's why he invented blockchain, he used a blockchain <laughs> rather than a block tree or, or, <laughs> or something like that in, in his uh, system, because he couldn't find a way to, 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 to use any more sophisticated and more efficient data structure for the ledger. Um, so, but in a sense, I uh, mean, you could just look at that distributed ledger as the update sequence. So you know, you could be building while this ledger is coming in, you could use the ledger as the yeah. sequence of operations necessary to keep each node keeping the tree. So it's not really that much of a practical limitation, is it? No, no. In fact, uh, his own software, uh, the, the software that miners use, yeah. uh, they actually have two, two data, uh, databases. Yeah inside them, which are not blockchains, right? Right, which yes. Is the the main yeah. pool where they store the transactions that have just arrived. And, uh, and the UTXO set, which is all the uh, accounts basically that have wasted, spent their funds. Yes. Uh, or that still have funds. Yes, uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, so internally, the, the, so, so what, what uh, function, functionality could the blockchain provide to uh, a distributed system, whatever. Uh, it's basically an append-only log. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, banks and uh, many large uh, company that operates uh, a decentral, uh, distributed, not decentralized <laughs> uh, service, I mean, must have those logs too. I mean, uh, even, even a central, totally centralized one, I mean, must have a log that, uh, that records all the operations that was made because if there is a bug, they need to, to replay the log or analyze the log. There is auditing. There are, there are lots of, fun of, yes. of uh, reasons why you may want an append-only log. Yeah. But those companies already have ways yeah. of doing append-only logs that are reliable. Say you, you pay two companies to you, you pay monthly to two companies to keep keep a copy of your log, and whenever you append an entry there, you send uh, you send uh, uh, a copy of what you appended to them, and they keep uh, they keep in sync or whatever. So I mean mirrored mirror data databases is not new. No. I mean, like, like, yeah, I mean, 500 meters from here, there is the data center of Santander in Brazil, and they have two buildings that are uh, 500 meters apart that keep two copies of all the databases, which is synchronized, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whatever. So, uh, they know how to do that. So what, what, what uh, I mean, people who propose uh, blockchain solutions to problems. They generally don't understand the problem. They don't understand. They don't know how the uh, companies already solved that, that problem. And often they don't understand the blockchain either. So uh, anyway. So the uh, other question that came to mind about the technology is some people say that this will be able to help uh, people who don't have access to banking services to get access to banking services. And to give just a little context to this, because it's a, it's sort of a, um, 
it's a little bit difficult to conceptualize for me because uh, again a lot of times when people talk about blockchain stuff they're they're not always as specific as you might like because of course they're very hopeful about it but the idea is if you were going to uh, take someone in a country that doesn't have particularly good uh, access to banking for some reason uh, is there some benefits to this kind of technology the decentralized blockchain kind of technology for getting those people access to banking in some way being able to accept and send payments for work they do over the internet or these sorts of things i've just heard this talked about as a potential benefit some people uh throw in sort of the illicit transaction aspect of it like funding wikileaks is often mentioned but we kind of already talked about that so i'm now talking more about people who governments are not really trying to prevent access to the banks they just don't have good access to the bank system does it help there at all uh, well i mean um, there are two answers for that well first of all i mean bitcoin is terrible I mean, bitcoin is not viable as a currency therefore i mean you cannot hope to <laughs> to be in with it. actually there are many reasons there. so so the first problem is that bitcoin is not a currency so how can you give access uh, to the un bank of the unbanker is, yeah. is, is a buzzword right yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, with with something that is not use not a useful currency, right? It will never be a currency of of, of commerce. The second is that well, the block the Bitcoin BTC in particular uh, can handle only uh, something like four four transactions per second, which is about one ten thousandth of what Visa does, <clears throat> uh, and most of those. Um, Four transactions per second is is probably mixing yeah, by people. Right. Uh, okay. uh, but uh, and that those four transactions per second, they account only something like that. If you have a million users, they can only, I mean, that's about three hundred fifty thousand transactions per day. If you have a million users, that, that means that they can do only one payment every three days. If you have ten million users, it's one payment per month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, it is totally. Technically, it is uh, not useful as a payment system. Um, and uh, the, the third thing is that, well, there are centralized solutions that are much better for that. You know about M-Pesa? No. Have you heard it? No. Uh, uh, yeah, M-Pesa is a, 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 a system that is used in Kenya. It's like the PayPal that is used there. And it works like this, the, the, the phone company uh, lets people transfer credits from their prepaid phones uh, to any other phone, right? So you just type in the phone number that the person you want to pay and uh, the amount and boop, that's transferred. So you don't even need a smartphone to use that system. Just a dumb phone is enough. <clears throat> and uh, you know, on every street corner, there are a little bodegas, a little places that let you pay in cash and uh, recharge your account uh, in the M-Pesa system. So it is used everywhere. I, I, I once used Google Street View to, to go into Kenya. And ah. <laughs> there were M-Pesa signs everywhere. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the very, I mean, it's really uh, very, very poor parts of the city, right? I mean, the, the streets are, uh, are unpaved and full of potholes and whatever, but there is M-Pesa everywhere. So okay. if they, they, in Kenya, they are using they are they are they are unbanked, they're totally banked. Yes, yes. <laughs> but that's just it, but it is centralized, right? It is run by the phone the phone company. Yes. Uh, and it is very cheap. I think uh, well the, the fees are if you transfer less than one dollar it is free and things like that. So So right uh, now there are a lot of people obviously trying to solve quote unquote some of these problems that we've mentioned, like, for example, the transactions per second problem, um, even Bitcoin itself has been trying to solve that with things like Lightning Network and so on. Have you looked much at new technologies uh, to the extent that they can be called technologies that people are trying to develop for uh, decentralized payment systems? And do any of them strike you as adding anything to the conversation or you think it's all just kind of pointless um, I, I mean well there are many so many um, 
uh, proposals and all of them claim to be completely different from yes. the other ones. I, yeah. I can't say that I'm tra keeping track of all of okay. those, but uh, the ones that I've looked at, I mean, they, they, they don't solve the problem at all. Okay. Like Repo, for instance, uh, claims to, to, to be a much better, much faster, much everything, and don't, doesn't use pure proof of work and doesn't use proof of state. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, by the theorem of that uh, 1993 theorem, then they should be either unsecure or centralized. Right. And uh, they claim that they are not, they are totally secure and they are totally decentral right. decentralized because they have this man, I mean, lots of uh, volunteer validators who are checking it. But if you read their white paper, I mean, down there is information that, well, it only works if every validator has 80% overlap uh, in his contacts with uh, any other validator. So, uh, and the only way, practical way that you can achieve that is if all of the validators have 80% overlap with a small list that is uh, uh, published by, by Ripple. Right, <laughs> of right. <people's> right. <laughs> right. So, yeah. uh, so, so, but try to, try to tell that to the, to the guys uh, Run repo, right? Mm -hmm. they, they keep insisting now that we are decentralized. It is impossible for the ledger to be, for repo to rewind and uh, replay the ledger because we are decentralized. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, what else? Well, the Lightning Network, I, I've, I mean, I've looked into it and there are several flaws in it that prevent it from scaling. I mean, it works, but in the sense that you send the payments, but uh, it it was built, it was meant to be the way for Bitcoin to scale to hundreds of millions of users. And uh, it cannot even scale to a million users that Bitcoin may have today. Or two million, I don't know what many people actually use Bitcoin. Yes. Uh, uh, but um, because there are, there are, um, I mean, many, many things that uh, the nodes needed to do in order to send payments that there is no algorithm for doing that. And I mean, you could prove that, I mean, of course, proofs are, uh, mathematical proofs are not uh, guaranteed that you cannot do the thing in practice, right? But, uh, but uh, I think you can prove that uh, the thing is impossible, the problems are impossible to solve because the data simply that they need is not there. They, they cannot get uh, the, I mean, uh, you're trying to guess a number without knowing anything about I mean, how it was generated or anything. So, um, so there are several problems like that in the Lightning Network concept, not the implementation. So, uh, I don't have any faith that, that it could ever work in the sense that <clears throat> of being able to scale Bitcoin. Uh, well, I. Uh, what I know. I was going to say, I think. Yota. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fortunately, the, Yota. Uh, no, it was another system that instead of using a blockchain, it uses a bag, a, a oh. direct a right? Okay. Have you heard of it? I, right. I have not. So, yeah. So the idea is that instead, each transaction was a little block by itself, and it pointed to two other <coughs> transactions, mm -hmm. and that created a big graph mm -hmm. that uh, things and uh, wave ends, wave ends, wave ends. <laughs> okay. That was. Sure, right. Okay. So, well, but they couldn't make that work. Uh, they had to put in a thing called a, a coordinator, <laughs> uh, centralized yeah. to, to make sure that the ledger be remained consistent yeah. and no double spend. Yeah. <laughs> and they prom they promised that they soon, soon, soon we will remove that coordinator. That's just temporary, right? Okay. So, uh, whatever, <laughs> that's, whatever. That's pretty great. There are, there are there are a couple of things, a couple of systems that have been designed by computer by uh, real computer scientists. I think one of them is Algorand by Silvio Micali from MIT. Okay. And the other one is uh, Avalanche or Avax. Yes, yes. By by Emin Sir from Cornell. Uh, but uh, I mean, as far as I know, they are uh, still classical. Uh, distributed consensus algorithms that depend on, on uh, having a, a, a certain percentage, minimum percentage of honest nodes, so it's probably half or two thirds or something like that. So, uh, 
I don't think that there is anything uh, that deserves to be to be called a cryptocurrency in the sense of being uh, solving the same problem that Satoshi uh, thought they had solved. Uh, that that works. That's 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 my knowledge so far. Well, I I think that's basically all my questions. Uh, did you have any closing thoughts you wanted to share with people? Uh, that maybe stuff that I didn't ask, for example, uh, that you that that you just wanted to get out there. Uh, well, I mean, Bitcoin is a Ponzi. <laughs> that <laughs> okay. <people> okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. But uh, but apart from that, in the technical from the technical perspective, I don't know. I think that uh, uh, maybe Satoshi himself realized it, that. Uh, his, his uh, invention was not working because he left, uh, um, I mean, uh, in something in mid-2010, uh, someone posted a, a, a version of his software that would let people mine using GPUs. Mm. And then the more GPUs you put in your computer, the more machine power you would have. And Satoshi was very angry about that, and this, he asked the guy to, 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 to please don't publish that software. Okay. <laughs> of course, <Okay. laughs> it was very useless, right? But because he, he, he felt that well, that would uh, I mean, go against uh, his hypothesis that mining would be well distributed. Uh, and in fact, I mean, that was the beginning of the race that led us to those huge mines that spend seven gigawatts of power or eight gigawatts of power, uh, which is more than Argentina or more than Austria. <laughs> Consume just, just to secure past transactions, right? I mean, you see that uh, the, the people say, well, that makes the system secure, but it only secures past transactions. Yeah. Uh, in order to secure, if you make another transaction, the miners have to spend a lot more money uh, securing that one. Uh, in fact, I mean, well, yeah, there is one one characteristic of, uh, well, first of all, if you are thinking of using uh, blockchain in, in some application, right, that you have to choose whether you use a public blockchain from some cryptocurrency or a private one. If you use a private one, well, it's the same thing as, <laughs> as uh, using, a, if you are centralized, it would be centralized and then you might as well use whatever technology you are using already. Right? And if you're using a public one, well, the public one uh, will only exist as long as, it, as there is people investing in the currency. Uh, so you are pegging your, your company <laughs> uh, serv uh, uh, services to basically a Ponzi scheme. But even if it is not a Ponzi scheme, it is for an investment scheme that depends completely on, on what the market will think. Uh, and um, um, that's uh, all those blockchains. They have the characteristic that a, a transaction that's for a certain amount X is not secure uh, until the miners have spent at least X, probably more than X, uh, mining blocks on top of it. So they 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 um, they spent uh, probably something like fifty million dollars a day of electricity today. So if you're sending $500 uh, million dollars, uh, in one transaction or several transactions, I mean, if all the clients to store uh, $500 million, they, uh, you should not trust that transaction until 10 days for 10 days, because <laughs> until then there right. is incentive enough for, for the miners to, to rewind it. I see. Right. So, so it is, it is a, a system that is, uh, expensive, I mean, absurdly expensive by design. Yes. I mean, in, order, in order to transact a certain amount of money, the, the operators have to spend <laughs> a similar amount of money. Uh, so, I mean, anyway, so that that's so that's one of the reasons why it doesn't make, I think, any sense to use uh, blockchains in, in public or private in, in the thing. Anyway, well, for whatever it's worth. It's, it's worth a lot. Thank you so much for uh, your time today. Can you give uh, the folks at home some idea of where is the best place to follow you online if they'd like to hear more 
uh, of what you're saying in the future? Is there is it Twitter? Is it you know wh where where's the right place to follow you? Well, currently I've been tweeting a lot about those things, but uh, I was very active and um, on uh, Reddit. And there is a subreddit called our Butcoin. B U T C coin. Right? Everyone loves that. <laughs> Everyone I've talked to talks about. Yeah, it okay. is the, the place where critics, uh, okay. the, the watering hole of critics, right? So, so, uh, so I post there, and uh, you can message me through there too. You can send me a mail, and my mail is uh, stofi at sign. Well, I can put it. Uh, put it on the chat if you want. Let me... I'll uh, I'll put it in the in when we post it for sure. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking with you, and uh, hopefully we could do it again sometime when maybe there's some more more <laughs> cryptocurrency <laughs> developments. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure, real, really a pleasure. I mean, one of the best best interviews I had. <laughs> well, I, you know what? Like I said, I would love to do it again. I'll I'll probably contact you sometime at the end of all this for another one. So if you enjoyed it, that's great because I would love to do it again sometime. Thanks so much for for joining us. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.